All right, good evening, everyone. <clears throat> I'm going to be speaking about drip irrigation tonight, primarily um, for home gardening and be applied to you know, other larger agriculture as well. So what I'm going to be talking about here, just from an agenda point of view, I'm going to do a quick introduction, kind of explain why I was interested in drip irrigation, why I've kind of pursued this, why you might also want to pursue it. Then I'm going to go into what are the basic components of drip irrigation, what does it actually take to install this. And then finally we're going to talk a little bit about what it takes to design a system for your own home. So who am I? To start with, I am definitely not an expert on this subject at all. I am an IT consultant that just happened to want to install a garden in my backyard. I live in a very suburban environment and I work a lot of hours. I travel a lot, I do a lot of these type of things and I found in my first year of gardening, I probably spent more time watering my plants than I did anything else in my garden. More time watering than I did weeding, more time watering than I certainly did harvesting, and I wasn't very pleased with the harvest that I got at the end of the year as well. So the, the season wasn't that good. So, um, you know, I, I prefix this by saying I'm not an irrigation expert and by any means. I am speaking about this just from my own personal experience and what I've been able to research on it. But I'm sure that you know there's others out there that can give you a lot more detailed information about how this works. As I had mentioned, why I'm interested in this is I was looking to start a garden. For me personally, it was more about getting you know closer to my food. I wanted to you know be more familiar with where my food is coming from, the quality of my food, and so forth. And you know fitting in with the oath keeper side of this, it was about prepping as well in the sense of being prepared to supply my family with food beyond what I can just get in a grocery store. As I already kind of explained, I am in a, a very suburban environment. So I have a small backyard. I have neighbors on all sides of me. I also live in an area of St. Louis County that is plagued with a lot of uh, pests, deer, rabbits, squirrels, and so forth. So for me, when I was designing my garden, I was looking for something that I could do that was a little more resilient to those type of things. So I ended up going with a container garden. My initial garden was nothing but a bunch of containers that literally lived on my deck. That way the deer were not quite brave enough to come and eat my food. Eventually I kind of graduated to a larger garden and I now have um, the more raised bed style garden in my back. And I'm using some other interesting techniques that keep uh, the pests away. But having a container garden brings with it a number of, uh, you know, some challenges in terms of watering. If you're using a standard you know, terracotta type of a pot or you're using a plastic type of pot, it's very, very easy to overwater your plants and soak them to the point that their roots rot and the plants die. That was definitely a concern of mine. So I, I researched some ways of being able to handle this, and one of the ways that we went with is decided to use a, uh, essentially a landscaping fabric-based pot instead of a terracotta pot. That essentially makes your pot more like a raised bed than an actual <laughs> container-type garden. And so the water in it wicks into the ground below it, and again, it, it becomes more like an extension of the ground than just a container. But all of this was kind of leading me to, I needed a way of being able to manage my water beyond just going out there with a hose and watering it every night during the hot summer. So that is really what I was, you know, what kind of led me to this decision to, to investigate irrigation. So what is drip irrigation? Really, it's just a simple tubing system. It, it really is just that. And at the end of these tubing systems are a bunch of little emitters. I actually have one here to show. So this is a drip emitter. There's several different types. This is a type that goes on a little post. 
so it's slightly raised above the ground. And it has a very tube that connects to it, and it has a very predictable drip rate. So this particular one right here will drip a half gallon for every hour that it's running. And that drip rate is really important when we talk about designing our system, which we'll get into here in a, a minute. So we have to be able to make sure we're not overwatering our plants and that we're not underwatering them. And so the fact that drip irrigation allows us to have a very predictable rate of flow is what makes it very advantageous. The other side of it, though, is that it's a pretty cheap system. Most of the plastic parts that are part of this are range in the, the cost range of cents, not dollars. That little emitter was about 10 cents. Um, other emitters maybe around 30 cents. The tubing is usually a few cents a foot, so you can buy 100 feet of tubing for just a handful of dollars. So it's not an expensive irrigation type of system. It's also very easy to do. And that kind of takes us into what are some of those benefits. The main one that gets pushed tends to be around water efficiency, however. When you have a sprinkler or you're watering with like a watering can or a hose, a lot of that water just sits on the surface and evaporates or runs away from the root system of your plant. And so you're not getting the water right where it needs to be. This little emitter, however, will just slowly drip and it keeps the ground around it moist. So there really isn't a lot of water waste. Water's not running away, water's not really evaporating. Just a few drips every few seconds as it kind of dribbles out of the end of it. So water efficiency is a big part of this. And water efficiency goes into savings. Um, you live in a metropolitan area, you're paying for your water. And so if you're having to water your plants year, add up pretty quickly to cost as well. So again, not just from a component perspective, you know, that this is a cheap part. It's also cheap from a, an ongoing um, maintenance point of view of actually running this system. In, in general, from my personal experience of doing this, I didn't notice any difference in my water bill by having this on the entire summer than I did when I didn't have it on. It was very marginal in terms of a cost increase. But the other advantage is I'd say it's also very versatile. So when I started, I explained I had a container-based garden that was literally on my deck. So I was able to run the tubing to each one of my potted plants, have an emitter in each one of the potted plants and keep it moist. Now that I have changed though to more of a bed-based garden, I can still use the same you know, techniques that I use to do the individual pots for that larger bed. Actually, doing it in the bed is, is easier, but the, the purpose of it is the, the exactly the same. And so it's very versatile. It's very easy to install. So here's an example of some of the tubing. So this is a half inch. This is a half inch nylon tubing. This is what your standard carrier tube would be. And we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get into the various components. But this is a very thin walled tube. So in terms of being able to install this, all you really need is a scissors. You don't need any expensive special tools. Um, the various uh, drip irrigation um, companies, though, have plenty of specialized tools that they would like to sell you, but you really don't need it. A scissor is more than good enough to be able to cut this. And the only thing you need is a tool to be able to punch a hole in this. Surely, you could use just a nail. It's very, very simple. So getting into some of the basic components. So when we're thinking about designing one of these irrigation systems, we, we need to understand our water source. So for me, my initial water source was a hose bib, just a normal hose outlet on the outside of my home. So I needed to be able to understand where that is, how far away from it is from my plants, and we'll talk about that in a lot of detail when we get into the designing. But there's other ways of hooking this up. Today, the way my irrigation system works is I had an existing in-ground irrigation for my lawn. I tap directly into that now for my water, so it's always on. 
I have a timer associated with it though to handle my, my cycles of the water, but I'm no longer connected to a hose bib. The other main component is a head assembly. And this is the most complicated part of your entire irrigation system is your head assembly. And it's really not that complicated. We'll go through each of these parts here, but this is a very typical head assembly. So we'll break this down and talk about the individual components of it. Then you have the tubing. The tubing comes in a range of sizes. And we'll talk about how you decide what size is important. And then finally, you have a number of fittings to connect the tubes, to do T intersections, to get it to all of the places that you need to. And then, of course, you have the drip emitters and some other miscellaneous. As I already mentioned, though, your, your typical water source is system. And so with your, your hose bib, most of connectors are already designed to fit a standard hose. You just literally screw it on. Unfortunately, though, your tubing is not a standard hose size. It isn't a standard hose at all. So you have other connectors that help you basically bridge between this size hosing and your normal um, garden hose. But again, there's a number of ways of supplying water to it. Most of them are you know, far outside the scope of what I'm going to talk to you tonight. I, I can tell you that for me personally, what I am switching to is a, a rain catchment system for feeding my, my garden. So it's completely off of the, you know, the MSD type water system or whatever. I don't want the public water source for it. So I'm going to switching over to rain water. But that brings some challenges as well because it's not pressurized and now you have to figure out how you're going to supply enough pressure to push the water through your hose. So breaking down the head assembly, the first thing you would typically see is your timer. And that's this top piece right here. It's a lot of different types of timers. This is a simple battery operated timer. It allows you to um, program a schedule into it for how frequently it water on and how many times a day. This particular one can turn the water on and off four times in a 24 hour period. And you can also program different schedules for weekdays versus weekend and so forth. So it gives you a lot of flexibility to be able to do it. There's also an override switch on this particular one where I can hook this up to a rain detection system where if it recently rained it will override the timer and it won't turn on. Um, but all of that is optional. You do not need this. In a very basic system, you can just hook it up and just turn it on periodically as you need water. I would suggest, however, you do have some sort of timer. It makes it much, much easier. At a pretty slow rate, that kind of half gallon an hour, maybe a gallon one of these type of systems is turning on and off several times in a day and running for fairly long periods of time water to your plants. The next piece in the head assembly, and this is not an optional component, this is your backflow preventer. So it prevents any inside of your irrigation system from backflowing into your home so you don't get any contamination into your water supply. A very simple little valve that basically just stops the water from flowing. The next piece that you would typically see is a filter. There's a lot of different types of filters, but why a filter is important is because the outlets on your emitters are very small and it's very, very simple to get them jammed and plugged with a little grain of sand or any sort of debris. And so you really do require some sort of filter to be able to keep the water clean. And again, this is just a very, very simple filter. You do have to clean this periodically, but it's just um, this particular one is designed to be able to take the filter out while the whole system is installed. A lot of the, the cheaper ones are in line and you literally have to disconnect everything to clean out the filter. And so as a kind of a tip, I would definitely go with something you can clean without having to disconnect your system. 
The next major piece that you will see is a pressure regulator. This is just another valve that has a spring inside of it. This will wear out over time, just as a note, but it's also another fairly cheap piece. I think this is like $1.25 for one of these. Your um, irrigation system does require a pretty normalized pressure. Most drip irrigation wants between 15 pounds per square inch to 25 pounds per square inch. This particular one is a 25 PSI um, pressure regulator. Again, it, it just has a spring inside of it. Usually your home pressure is way higher than that. So we're actually lowering the pressure down, but we want to try to regulate it to keep it average. But this is exactly also why a, a typical rain catchment system that isn't pressurized would have problems being able to push it because it can't get the 25 pounds of pressure unless you had like a little makeshift water tower or something where you were raising it up in the air to provide the pressure. And the last typical piece that you're going to see is the part that takes it from the hose connection and brings it down into your actual um, tubing for your system. And that's what this is, it just converts it. There's, there's one more piece that's optional that you will see as part of mini head assemblies, and that's an, um, a fertilizer injector. And I, also, I do have a fertilizer injector, but I would warn that they're, they're quite pricey. And when I say quite pricey, I think they range about two to $400 for a, a irrigation fertilizer injector. It also does require um, specialized fertilizer. It has to be a liquid fertilizer, again, because you can't use a, a water-soluble standard fertilizer with most of these screens. It'll clog it up. So that's just a, a quick note that if you're really, really lazy like I am, you would probably want to do some sort of fertilization injection as well as part of your system. So your plants are not just getting watered, but every single watering is giving them a minute amount of fertilizer at the same time. And again, from a liquid fertilizer point of view, it is available in organic forms, inorganic, and all of that sort of thing. So if you are interested in organic gardening, you can still use liquid fertilizer for it. I would also warn, though, that there's um, some very cheap uh, fertilizer injectors on the market, and I have tried them, and they are very much not reliable in terms of how much fertilizer they inject into your system. And that can be very problemsome if you inject too much and now you burn your plants and they're killing them. I, I just, again, warn against them. They're not worth it. You're better off having no fertilizer injector than going with a cheap one. So as mentioned, your next major component is the tubing. It's available in a poly or a vinyl. Um, there really isn't any difference between the two in, in terms of performance. The main difference is the thickness of the wall. The vinyl is a little bit thicker than the poly. The poly tends to be thinner. The poly, the poly tends to be a little stiffer as well. So it's a little harder to maneuver around your garden than the vinyl is. The thing that's common to all of these irrigation systems is you have some sort of main line to deliver your water. And when we get into the designing part, we'll talk about why that is. But essentially, you need a larger tube that goes into a bunch of smaller tubes. That's really what it means. And the, your mainline tube is either going to be a half inch at minimum or up to a full inch if you have a very large supply of water that you're trying to do. The other side of it is the microtubing. That's typically what will go to the individual plants. If you're doing a bed, however, Usually, you would still use a main line tubing, just do it in a very long line and have emitters all the way along. In this picture up here, this is an example of the micro tubing being stuck into the main line. So it's just a branch off of it, essentially. And how you install this is there's a little barb fitting. You literally just pop a hole in it, push the barb into the tube, and it provides enough of a seal when it's pressurized that it won't leak. Which brings us to the fittings themselves. There is a lot of different fittings. There's Y fittings, T fittings, L fittings, every kind of fitting you can think of. The thing I would mention here, though, is the types. This is what's called a permalock fitting I have right here. So basically what you do with this type of fitting is you would push your tubing onto the end of it. 
just like that, and then you screw this down until it's tight, and that's what provides your seal. And so this is now sealed, it won't come off as long as this is tight, and it's reusable. So the other type is a compression fitting. Compression fittings are a little bit cheaper than the permalocks, but the compression fitting is a once use. And like any plastic, even though this has UV protectant in it, it will eventually wear out in the sunlight and you will need to replace this at some point. And so to me, the, the difference in cost for a compression fitting is not worth it because you end up having to replace all of your fittings as well as the tubing. So just again, keep that in mind. And then the last one is the barbed fitting. The barbed fitting though you really only see in the micro tubing. And this is just an example of a barb fitting right there. Essentially it's a small little barb on the end of the tube connector. And it pushes in, expands the tubing and essentially locks it. Very simple. So the watering devices, these are your emitters essentially, but there's a few different types of emitters. All of the emitters I have in my system are simple drip emitters like this, but there are micro sprinklers that literally will have a little pop up and they sprinkle the water all over. There's various sprayers as well. There's also misters. And so it depends on the type of you know, plants that you're growing. Some flowers prefer to have the water fall down on top of them. Others don't like to be touched by water. And as an example, lettuce is okay with being wet. Tomatoes are not. Um, so in general, though, this it goes directly to the roots where the sprayers and the sprinklers are kind of going up in the air and there is more waste. They also require a lot more water and a lot more pressure to run as well. Well, I guess the, the last one I would say is the drip tape. Um, it's not really an emitter per se, it's really just a lighter version of this with holes already pre-installed in it. The problem I have with most drip tape is it can really only be laying in a line. I cannot move it around the plants, it has to go in a straight line. It's also quite a bit thinner walled than this is. And so if you have pressure beyond about 15 pounds per square inch, you can actually burst your, your line. And so it's not very durable either, but it's extremely cheap. I mean, it's, it's pennies a foot, and so you can get hundreds of feet of the thing for just a few dollars. So it is definitely an option. It's just I, I don't personally think it's a very good option. So a few more things on the pressure, or on the dripper emitters themselves, is they do come in a couple different types. This is what's called a pressure compensating dripper. So the idea behind the pressure compensating is that your pressure in your tubing will vary as it goes up and down over your terrain. So if you have dips in your terrain, the pressure is gonna be heavier. As you have spikes up as you're going up over your hill, the pressure is less. And so a, a drip emitter that's like this is able to you know, consistently drip at the same rate regardless of the pressure, as long as it's within a range. So I mentioned earlier that it's about 15 pounds to 25 pounds is kind of an ideal range for these. So as long as it's within that range, it'll always drip consistently. The non compensating ones will not. And you can end up with some very strange results as when you're using them, they are cheaper than these, but when I say cheaper, instead of 10 cents, it's like eight cents. So it's really a big difference in cost. So the other miscellaneous components you would see are various stakes, various risers to hold the tubing. This tubing is fairly stiff. It does not like to hold still. It doesn't like to, to stay where you put it. So I definitely would suggest that you get some sort of stakes to keep it in place because as the sun hits this, it will expand and it'll move and it'll do all sorts of things that you really don't want it to do, so stake it down. So those are really the only other components though that are part of your system. As I did mention earlier though, in terms of tools, there are a number of specialized tools. If you're doing a lot of this, it probably is worth buying one of those tools. They have specialized punches that make it very easy to punch the holes in here to put the microtubing. 
They also have specialized cutters and so forth. But in general, you literally can get away with a little nail and a scissors. So into designing your system. I guess the, the first thing I'd warn intimidated by this. All of this really truly is easy, but it does require some math. It does require some planning. We need to work out how much water we are going to need for our plants, and because of that, we have to do some calculations. But it is all very basic stuff, so I would suggest if you are interested, sticking with it, not getting too intimidated. So what do we actually need to know? The main thing, this will turn, is we need to know where our water source is. All of this tubing has a certain capacity, which we'll talk about in I think, the next slide. But it's very important to know where we are going from and where we're going to. So we really have to identify where our water source is and that distance to our garden. We then need to know how much water our plants actually need. This is where it gets a little complicated because we have to deal with things like, well, what if it's raining? What if the, what is the temperature? difference in terms of how much water our plants require. I do have some charts in here that we can go through to help with that. Also need to understand the number of plants we're actually going to use. So each one of the emitters you have is taking a little bit of water out of the tube, right? So if I have a small micro tubing, I can at max supply 30 gallons of water down that tube. So if I have one gallon an hour emitters, I can only do 30 of them before I'm out of capacity and then I have no more water. And so it's just part of your planning. You need to understand how many plants I'm going to run to. And then you also do need to understand a little bit about your soil type. So in, in terms of um, the water source considerations, the, the main thing that you want to be aware of is if you are using a hose bib and I'm installing this head assembly to it, do I actually have enough room to install my hose assembly to here? When I first did my planning and I purchased all my little parts and was very excited to go out and install it, just to find out that I was about six inches short before I hit the ground. So I ended up having to make some modifications to make all of this work. But that's the main thing I would say that you have to be um, you know, considerate of is do you actually have enough space to have all these little pieces and all the parts hanging underneath your hose bib. I would say that actually most standard hose bibs do not have enough room to install this. And so what you do in that case is, well, get creative. I essentially created a little piece that came down with PVC pipe and it was connected and made it go right back up so it's now taller. other side though you also need to be aware that if you're hooking this to your hose bib you're losing your garden hose spot too so again consider using some sort of Y adapter or something like that just to keep that in mind so how much water do you need this is literally the in my opinion the most difficult part to figure out if you have a standard garden it's not so bad because we can do it just based on kind of the square footage of the garden but in my case, where I had all of these pots that I was trying to supply water to, each one of them has a different volume. Each one of them has a different plant in it that it requires a different amount of water. And so there was a lot of calculation that went into it to figure out how long can I actually run this with a half gallon emitter in this one, five half gallon emitters in this other one, so it would balance out and they would all get an equal amount of water. It really was kind of a pain to figure all of that out. But again, it, it's fairly simple to understand. Typically, your vegetables need one to two inches a week. That does vary by plant type. Some plants are more water hungry than others. Some are also less tolerant of overwatering than others. Definitely suggest you spend a little time researching your plants, but for, for the most part, they're, they're all in that range. Temperature, though, does make a difference, and we'll talk about that in a chart here in a minute. 
So in order to figure it out, though, we have to understand what is our actual flow rate in one of these tubes. How much water can we get through? And we'll talk about that when we get to the tubing. But we also then need to understand, well, when you're talking about inches, every one of these components is measured in gallons per hour. So how do I go from gallons per hour to inches of rainfall? And I guess the important part here is to understand that when they're talking about inches of rainfall, you're essentially talking about a cubic inch. And so then when we're talking about a cubic inch, we're talking about how that will spread out over a piece of you know, ground. And so if we can calculate the volume of soil, we can figure out how many cubic inches do we need to be able to cover that with water. And again, we will go in and do some math here in a second. But essentially, one of water one cubic inches. So let's do some math. So if we take some basic parameters, let's say we have a one cubic foot root ball, which is rather small by the way, but we'll just use this to keep the math simple. And we require two inches of water a week. And we have a half gallon emitter, just like this one. How much water do we need to do? Well, really what we're trying to figure out is what is the duration? How long do I need to be able to run this every day in order to get the right volume of water? So one cubic foot is 144 cubic inches. Two water is 288 cubic inches. So we just divide that, and now we know we need 1.25 gallons. That's how much water we need every week in order to supply this plant with that desired two inches of water. So we take that, we divide it out by our emitter. 2.5 hours or 150 minutes a week that this needs to be running. We can divide that by our number of days in the week and so forth. What you find out here though is that in many cases when you have a plant, having a single emitter is just not enough. You might need two or three of these emitters to be able to get it down to a time period that is reasonable. So for my garden, for instance, I'm running my timer four times a day for about two and a half minutes for each run. So it's a very short period of time, just comes on a few times a day and runs it. I don't have any periods of time where I'm running for 21 minutes, half hour, or anything like that. It's usually short durations. That does, though, depend a little bit on your, on your soil type, which we'll talk about. So the things to keep in mind, if we are talking about that average type of garden, or even a raised bed, we don't need to have exact per plant calculations. We can average it out for the entire bed. We're just going to figure out what the volume of soil is in my, in my plant bed, my garden bed, or figure out what is the volume of soil uh, in a typical row of crops in my garden. As I mentioned though, if you're using a container garden like I was, well, you have a lot more math to do. So, have fun. Um, you also use more than one emitter. And also make sure to factor in your average rainfall. So plants need two inches of rain a week, and I just received an inch. Well, I need to factor that into my schedule. Because if I go ahead and then add another two inches to that in that week, I am now overwatering. And again, depending on the plants, they might not be tolerant to that. Some plants might be completely OK. Most of the plants I have are all right with that, so I usually ignore the rainfall because I'm within my range that's appropriate. But that isn't always the case. It amounts does vary temperature. This is a pretty standard gardening chart that you will find. You just search online for watering needs by temperature. So when they typically say that vegetable gardens need an inch of rain a week, that is an average temperature of 60 degrees in the week. And so when we say average temperature here, it's literally just taking the high plus the low divided by two. So our average temperature in the summer is not 60 degrees here in Missouri, here in St. Louis. So we need quite a bit more water than that. So as you can see, as our temperature goes up, our water needs also go up. So you do need to keep that in mind when you are planning out this system. 
So in the springtime, you may be perfectly okay with running an inch a week. In the middle of summer, and again, basics, what that actually equals in terms of gallons for a square. Soil does matter though. For me, all of my soil is completely tailored from what I had in my pots and now what I have in my raised bed. So I have an ideal soil situation. So I don't have to worry about soil type at all. I average it out. But the things to keep in mind is that if you have very sandy soil, it rains very, very and so you're going to want your drippers closer together because the water won't get a chance to spread out. It basically goes straight down in your soil. And if you have clay soil, it's going to do the exact opposite. It's going to spread out and take quite a bit of time to actually sink in. Down. I think I have a, the next chart that tells us a little bit about that. But how much? order to get down six inches of depth inside of a clay based soil, you need between eight and ten inches of rainfall to actually seep that far down in dry soil. So you need quite a bit more water than you do for the depth. And you can see in the sand, the, we don't even need six inches of water to be able to sink down that far because it just starts running straight down. So again, these are some of the things that you need to understand when you're designing this, is what is my soil like? For a typical garden, though, we are, we're trying to get this kind of a loamy type of soil where we're somewhere in the middle, where we have good drainage, but we also have good water retention. That's what our ideal is. Another thing to understand, though, is how deep is the root systems for our plants? And this is just a, a chart to show some common vegetables. So if you look at something like a tomato plant, a mature tomato plant can literally have its feeder roots down up to four feet into the soil. They dig very far in search of water. And so that's, a, again, something you need to keep in mind when you're watering this is make sure that you are getting the depth for your volume when you're calculating volume, not just the area. You can't just expect that you need to have it moist down a foot. You might need it moist down several feet. The next thing that you're going to want to consider is the timing of how, when are you going to run your water, how frequently you're going to run your water, and so on. So I, I mentioned that I personally run mine four times a day. That is more just to kind of balance it out. I do not um, run it in the dead of the day though. I don't try to go at the hottest point of the day because I, I do want to try to avoid evaporation. So I'm usually doing it in the morning early um, evening, then I do it very late evening, and also once in the middle of the night is how my personal schedule is kind of set up. But it, typically though, morning is the best time to water. So tube capacity. So I already alluded to this a little bit, but these tubes do have a fixed volume. They can only have so much water flowing through them and so I mentioned with the microtubing, you do have a limitation of 30 gallons per hour. That also, from a pressure point of view, you can have a maximum run of 30 feet before it loses its pressure. That is actually um, much easier to break than you would think. Um, most of my beds are only about 10 feet long, but after I have all the little side runs to each individual plant, I easily um, and past the 30 foot mark and so for my beds I'm not even able to use the microtubing. I have to use more of a tube like this to carry my water. But this is also where I said it's important to understand where your water source is. If your garden's a few hundred feet away from your house, well we're going to make sure we need to have a higher capacity main line to carry the water out there. So you may very well need to go with a three quarter inch tubing instead. As the tubing gets bigger, it does get more expensive. 
you know, it's not a wildly expensive thing no matter what you're doing, but it does get up there in price as you start getting into bigger tubes. Usually when you're talking about the one inch tubes, that is typically what you would see in commercial irrigation. Most of the um, consumer irrigation sources don't even sell the one inch tubing. But it is available if you are, have a need. So this is kind of reiterating what I've already said, but really the maximum run length, why that's important is because we want to keep a, a, a consistent pressure all the way across in our tubing. And once we breach that maximum length, our pressure starts to drop pretty rapidly. And then obviously the maximum gallons per hour is we just need to make sure that we have enough water to feed every one of the emitters we have on there. Nothing too magical about that. So how do you get started? Well, I think the easiest way to get started is to grab a piece of paper and literally draw out your plan. Draw where your house is, draw where your garden is, note down how many feet it is, note how many bends you have so you can understand how many little connectors you're going to need to have to make this work. Again, this stuff is not all that flexible. If I bend it, it kinks. So if I want to go around a corner, I need a connector to, to go around that corner. So you need to understand where all of your corners are, where every place you're going to have to tee off of this, any of those type of things. And in my opinion, the easiest way of doing that is just to draw it out. Make it very simple, and then you can turn that drawing essentially into your parts inventory so you know what to buy and price it out very easily as well. So it looks basically something like this. You have all of your beds laid out. And this is a case, this case is a, a raised bed type garden. So literally we have a main line that goes to each one of the beds. That main line has a single line that goes on the side and then we have our drip emitters going down these feeder lines. It's a very simple system. Something like that shouldn't take more than even a few minutes to, to lay out and design. Again, if you're doing more of a container based, it is definitely more complicated. But for gardens, for raised beds, this is extremely simple. So some tips and tricks. One, this will come coiled up. And as I mentioned, it's stiff. If you want to work with it, let it sit out in the sun a little bit. It becomes soft, becomes pliable. You can now straighten it out and get it mostly straight. But as I also mentioned, you're going to want to clip it down and hold it down because as the sun hits it, it's going to want to bend back and do things like that. At the same time though, it is much, much easier to punch this when it's cold. So put your holes in it before you let it heat up in the sun. Or do it early in the morning or something like that when you're actually going to put the punched holes in this. When this is warm, trying to punch holes in it, it is not a fun task. It just will bend. Yep. Yep. Well, I'd actually probably just use some ice water as opposed to an ice cube, but yeah, you can definitely cool it off. And that's actually one of the tips here for tubing. The microtubing can be a little bit hard to get on those barbed ends, but if you just take a cup of warm water or hot water, dip it in there for 10 seconds, it's now pliable, it'll go right on. There's no reason to try to force it on these things and give yourself a headache. It's very easy just with a little bit of warm water. And Another, I think, really important thing is do not over tighten these connectors. They're all plastic. I have yet to see anyone that really makes these in any sort of metal components or anything. So if you over tighten them, it's very easy to wreck it. So do not over tighten. They seal quite well. You, you just have to have it finger tight, and that's enough to keep it from dripping. So there's no need to tighten it down to the point where it wrecks the thing. The other thing I would definitely highly suggest is when we go, if I go back here actually, and we look at this bed, you potentially have multiple beds that are feeding off of this and multiple lines. If I was designing this system, I would definitely install some valves in here so I can do some maintenance every now and then so I can turn off the water here and not have to worry about it still feeding this garden. So that's another thing just to keep in mind from a tip is consider installing valves wherever you think that it would fit just so you could turn off the water source very easily. 
So what resources do you need to get started? There's a number of companies that sell this stuff. This is one that I've used. It's Dripworks. I think I actually probably purchased most of the stuff from Drip Depot. These companies that specialize in it definitely have the best prices. They do tend to sell some of these things in bulk, though. You usually can't buy one of these 10 cent emitters one at a time. You usually have to buy like a pack of 10 or a pack of 20 of them. But if you're doing a garden, chances are you're buying 20 of them anyways. That said, though, Home Depot and Lowe's carries all of these components. They have them usually in their plumbing section. I don't know why it's there and not in their gardening section, but that's where they are, is in the plumbing area. I, I would say, though, my experience with what you can get at Lowe's and Home Depot is it tends to be um, not nearly as good quality as the stuff you're buying from these specialized dealers. Most of the stuff that you're buying from these specialized dealers is also made in the USA. It's not Chinese type parts. I, I don't know that that really makes a big difference on these because they're all pretty cheap anyhow, but they are mostly made in America where a lot of the Home Depot and Lowe's stuff is cheap Chinese plastic. The last thing I'd suggest is when you're looking for more plant information, University of Missouri Extension, they have a lot of information on their website. Probably one of the most atrocious websites I've had to try to navigate and find things, but it does have a lot of really, really good information that's very specific to our area in terms of watering schedules, in terms of what the plants actually need for care here in St. Louis area. So it, it's definitely worth looking there. And also, if you're really, really interested, they have a Master Gardener program. Um, and so you can learn to be a Master Gardener. Well, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Very, very good.